Hello, everyone. Thank you for spending lunchtime or breakfast with us based on your time zone on this fine Friday. Uh, my name is uh, Ardip Beko. I'm a Client Partnerships Director at Adstream, where I spend most of my time helping our clients make progress towards their ongoing digital transformation objectives and dreams. Today, I am joined by uh, Jim Nail, Principal Analyst at Forrester, where he covers a wide range of topics, including marketing measurement, rise of direct-to-consumer brands, and of course, the integration of offline and online touch points. In fact, uh, our discussion today is inspired by one of Jim's reports. Also with us today, we have uh, Harold Geller, Executive Director at AdID, the industry standard for the registration of advertising assets across all media platforms. Harold speaks and writes extensively about uh, marketing supply chains, interoperability, and media. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us today and I'm really, really excited uh, about the next one hour um, in our discussion. Awesome. So. Um, and let's level set and define what we're talking about today. Um, at Astrium, I'm lucky to work with a variety of marketing organizations, brands, agencies, you know, media companies, and everyone is thinking about digital transformation. However, from uh, our conversations with them, you know, you can tell it's a nuanced concept and it means different things to um, different functions within an organization. At its core, though, um, we can definitely see it, and you can see from the data here that it is not a passing trend. Um, the way the way we basically define it is that you know um, it is it is uh, a way of harnessing capabilities of emerging technology to digitally reinvent a company's you know, operations, products, marketing, culture, and goals for growth. And you can you can see from the and just hear from the wide span and scope of digital transformation that uh, it could be uh, sometimes a game of who is owning what. And the way we see it is that marketing sits at the center of all of these areas. Um, and when we talk to our clients about their marketing and advertising, um, a lot of times video just is top of mind and remains key to their initiatives. So today, we really want to start our conversation and our discussion um, to talk about first, you know, the state of TV and video advertising today. Because while video has been around for a while, marketers are facing a fresh set of challenges. And we wanted to start first by, you know, looking at the media landscape, both supply and demand. We have recently gone through all of the amazing presentations of um, media, media organizations in their upfronts. Um, so we, a lot, a lot of what was announced um, in, these, um, in these events and presentations to uh, buyers and advertisers is really telling about you know, what's happening in the media landscape. Um, and one, one of the things that I love about the upfronts is how Hulu pushed themselves uh, into it um, and insisted for a while that they were, you know, they, they never had a new front, new fronts um, a presentation, which is, you know, what the IAB organizes for digital uh, companies, media companies. They were saying, no, we are playing with the actual big guys with the upfronts. So I'm really curious, guys, to um, from your perspective, Jim and Harold, on um, you know, what, what are these recent developments telling us about uh, what's to come? Uh, I guess I'll jump in. Um, it, it, it's really the, to me, it's the beginning, or it's like the end of the beginning. Right. Uh, what I mean by that is we've talked about this kind of convergence happening. People have dabbled in, you know, a little bit of advertising and OTT and CTV over the years, a little bit of online video. And we're kind of at the end of the dabbling phase. And we're at the point um, where marketers realize that just the way consumers are viewing content and, uh, and behaving today, that if you want to have those uh, you know, traditional 
uh, and I think immutable uh, need to reach them and get your message in front of them that you got to get beyond dabbling. And all these different forms of video have to be thought of as an integral part of the plan. And just to, to add to that, Jim, I think that in addition to the end of the period of dabbling, I think we're at the, we're, at a, we're on the, on the edge of a very interesting period of collaboration. Uh, we've got some very exciting uh, collaborative initiatives going on in terms of the data initiative uh, where multiple broadcast, m multiple media publisher entities are working together. So you've got project or where you've got publishers and data providers and marketers working together. Uh, and then you've got, um, you know, so that's open AP and then you've got project or where you've got a multitude of media publishers, agencies, data companies, uh, addressable advertising companies, consumer electronics manufacturers, all coming together. So uh, I like to think about the, you know, as you said, I, you know, sort of the, be the beginning of the end of the dabbling and really getting into doing things at scale. And it's interesting that we're seeing this, this you know, sort of the, what I call the beginning of the era of some strange bedfellows. Uh, you know, people getting together and finding the the places where they all can work together and rather than competing with each other, innovating, uh, you know, creating a baseline and then innovating above that baseline um, and competing uh, for the things that truly are of a competitive nature rather than the plumbing and the infrastructure layers. Definitely. And Thank you, guys. And I, what we see, you know, while while the media landscape is changing and shifting um, at a at a micro level, what we see is um, from all the seven thousand plus advertisers um, that rely on us in distributing content and advertising content for them, we see some some things that some of these changes and major seismic changes, as Jim loves to, to use that uh, metaphor, um, are, are really already reflecting in what, what, what advertisers are creating. And you know, we, we have seen um, on the TV front a decline in SD video, uh, which um, is, is symptomatic for us because um, it also kind of follows together the um, requests from advertisers constantly around saying, you know, where can, when can we actually start creating content that gets supported by uh, media owners, you know, um, and, and platforms for, for 4K, for example. Um, so that, that already shows that um, there is a bit of a disconnect between um, what the advertisers, where the advertisers are seeing uh, the consumer shifting towards, and then what the uh, the media landscape and the advertising space can offer them to follow that consumer. Cool. So when we um, when we look at these trends, we definitely uh, all all agree that there's there's a piece, there's there's changes afoot. Uh, but we uh, really, I really keen to hear your thoughts, Jim, on um, what this means to um, the advertisers and their um, ecosystems. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've seen that the you know the TV ecosystem has been extremely stable for at least thirty years, and I could arguably you know go back to the pre-cable era. Uh, in terms of the fact that um, you know, you had one format for your ad and you distribute it to all the different programmers to run it. Um, and there was one system for doing that. Um, and you know, it was, it was you know, honed down to an extremely efficient um, you know, kind of process. So you know, now, um, I, I think up to this point, again, marketers have felt like, oh, for something like OTT, geez, I'm going to have to transcode it. You know, it's there's not enough scale. It's not worth the time or trouble to do that. So I'll kind of, you know, ignore that uh, for the time being. Um, and so we're at this point where, uh, you know, these various forms of video are real. They have real audiences. Traditional linear audiences are no longer sufficient. Uh, to meet your goals. 
And so we have to, to face this different and more fragmented and more diverse ecosystem um, that thank goodness, as Harold mentioned, there are some good uh, collaborative things going on across the industry and across the different stakeholders who are, you know, over time will develop new standards that will remove some of the, the friction that we're going to see for the next, you know, probably a couple of years until those things really get established and get propagated across the industry. Um, but it's just a, a fact of reality that, that this ecosystem is going to get more complicated and that advertisers, you know, in order to uh, meet their goals are going to need to use all these different forms of video and therefore uh, will need to adapt to the, the technical differences and, and the demands of each of those, those different forms of video. And, and Jim, just to interject so, something here, what, you know, I couldn't agree more in terms of the stability over the years of linear broadcast media and how the digital platforms and alternate sources are, uh, are, are finding, their, you know, are, are outpacing growth. But even linear television, you know, we start thinking about some of the things that are happening in addressability in linear television. That area as well is becoming increasingly complex and increasingly digital. So we really are seeing convergence, not just in uh, the new media, but convergence in, in the uh, in the traditional media as well. Yeah. Well, I think that's, you know, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised and you could probably know whether, you know, part of the impetus behind or is the fact that, you know, addressable TV via the traditional MVPDs has been around for, you know, five, six years, but dish has one way of doing it. Direct TV has a different way of doing it. Comcast, blah, blah, blah. And so a lot of advertisers again have shied away from it. Uh, because of that complexity, uh, and so hopefully, the, hopefully the, you know, the the convergence of OTT and those things will have learned a lesson from that, <laughs> and come up with these ways of of just making that process much more coherent. As as you said, it's like you know, let's compete on the things that are important, not on, um, you know, this infrastructure stuff. Correct, and and you know, in, 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 uh, as we say, the, you know, the the whole area of improving addressability, making addressability more consistent. Now, to your point, the MVPDs have been doing addressability for years. However, now we actually have the technology that allows addressability to scale beyond the two to three minutes that are available right. to MVPDs. Right. Uh, and there's, there's great opportunities for targeting and for messaging and customization. So, yes, consistency is going to be the most important piece. Right, right. And to that point, guys, I mean, you are talking about the um, some of the silos, even within the measurement side or the addressable side, um, you know, beyond keynote speeches and you know, strategy decks. We we talk about um, always about this dream and this end goal of uh, bringing everything together. But there is a gap right now between that end goal and the day-to-day -day planning and execution processes. So my question for you is, you know, how do we bring together, um, not just on the measurement front, but just overall this video advertising beyond linear OD, OTT uh, lines? You know, are, are, one of the things you have to keep in mind as well, and, and you're absolutely correct in that there are still a lot of people who see silos, you know, we, we see silos of linear and on-demand uh, platforms, you know, like we talk about here in terms of over the air, online, all the way into um, ad-supported ad in-flight advertising. Um, there are a lot of people who see silos. The consumer just sees content, and they need to see, they, they see content where, you know, where they want to see it, when they want to see it, how they want to see it. Uh, and they want to seamlessly be able to go from a mobile device to their over-the-top device and just instant, instantaneously pick up where they left off. And we need to be thinking as an industry in that manner. Um, and uh, to, you know, part of the challenge that we have is um, if we don't do a lot of those experiences right, we, we run the risk, you know, the ad-supported universe runs the risk of 
of actually sending uh, consumers further and further into the subscription video on demand model versus the ad supported or hybrid models. Yeah, I mean, uh, another way of putting that, I, I talk about uh, often about the immutable laws of, of advertising. And I think one of those immutable laws is that people will come home at the end of a hard day at work, you know, have dinner, put their kids to bed, and they're going to want to watch TV and relax for a couple of hours. Let, let me put it this. They will want to watch long form video entertainment, you know, and be entertained for a couple hours before they go to bed. Now, uh, Harold, as you said, as we know, they're looking across all these screens now. And so there's a fundamental shift, particularly among you know, traditional TV planners, that it's no longer about GRPs. It's about you know, the, this, this shift back to thinking about reach instead of GRPs. It's how do I piece together that audience that I used to be able to easily buy from, you know, three or four networks. Um, how do I now piece it together across all of these, these different screens? Um, and it is challenging these days because we don't have a, you know, single source cross screen uh, audience measurement uh, 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 data source available to us. So again, there's new things in the ecosystem that uh, advertisers and their agencies need to work through to uh, come up with a new approach uh, to understanding uh, what that audience is. But, you know, the good news is that it, 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 it also goes away from, you know, let's, let's break the programming centric mindset. I'm going to buy, you know, this show because it's high rated among, you know, women 25 to 54. Um, and I, I was talking with a baby products company uh, a couple of days ago, and they made the point that there are 8 million diapering moms in the United States. Um, and in this world, well, well, let's get in front of those 8 million diapering moms. And if, if they're not diapering, why do I care if they're 25 to 54, you know? Um, and if I can get 100% reach against those 8 million diapering moms for my brand, that's probably a whole lot better than getting a 70% reach against 25 to 54. Absolutely. And, you know, and Jim, one of the things that I see as a challenge, and is actually, I'm interested in hearing your point of view on this, is we have built a, an advertising ecosystem of advertising generalists, um, and we built specialist silos. Um, how do we get to that, uh, you know, the, 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 the generalist view, you know, it's almost a back to the future kind of view where looking back at the consumer rather than the specialist silo. Mm -hmm. Well, probably the, the, the worst specialization we have now is the uh, disconnect between planning and buying. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's funny, I'm running into that. I'm doing a project with my colleague here, Joanna O'Connell, uh, who comes from the programmatic digital space. Uh, she was CMO of Media Math for a while. Um, and we're doing a joint project looking at exactly this topic of how do we bring the, you know, this omni-channel video world into, into existence. And, you know, she's having a hard time wrapping her head around that disconnect between planning and buying. Because, of course, in programmatic digital, you know, that all happens within, you know, 100 milliseconds or 100 nanoseconds or whatever, right? Um, versus in traditional TV, you have you know, planners on one side and they come up with all this great stuff and then they throw it over the wall to the buyers who then have to throw out most of what the planners did so they can get back to women 25 to 54, you know? Um, and it's a wonderful real-time feedback loop. You know, I think exactly. about that and, and think about the fact that, yeah, the, all of, you know, I think about the specialization in the media investment side but the reality is the convergence of the media investment and the media analytics and planning mm. um, all of a sudden start to break down when you start to see this real-time feedback loop that we have. Mm, you know, I'm not as big a advocate for that um, because in most product categories, it's still, you know, like take all a CPG, you know, 
E-commerce is a minuscule part of CPG, growing pretty quickly, but still minuscule. And most purchases are still going to happen on that weekly trip to the grocery store. So how fast are you getting that feedback? And should you really, you know, be making changes, you know, more than, you know, any earlier than two, three, four weeks into a campaign? Um, you know, unless as one of the things I talk about in my measurement coverage is, you know, can you find some other digital type proxy um, that is predictive of that, what's going to happen on that shopping trip, you know, four days later, five days later, that you can then optimize around. But I don't think people have really quite gotten there. So I'm a little more cautious about um, how much the analytics and how fast people can really act on that kind of analytics and data they're gathering. And some of these, uh, some of these um, ideas around converging data sets, and uh, I mean, that's, that's one of the, when we talk to marketers, um, identity and data and uh, just the quality of just targeting um, users properly, um, it's, it's, it's an issue. However, um, if we're looking at the online advertising uh, world, some of these um, silos have broken, have been broken down for, let's say, display advertising. Um, however, um, online video advertising remains pretty uh, problematic for some, you know, these silos are still still very visible there. Um, why do you guys think that's the case? Uh, why has video pro proven to be different? Because it is, um, and I don't mean to. Be, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I don't mean to be flip, but you know, display largely is a very direct response. You know, kind of tactic or strategy, whichever you want to call it. Yeah. You're counting click throughs you're counting how many people got to the website and converted, et cetera, et cetera. Um, video by its nature, by the nature of sight, sound, and motion um, is, you know, branding and awareness and emotional connection with the brand that ultimately manifests in those purchases. Um, but it isn't that, you know, kind of Pavlovian, you know, ring the bell and the consumer starts salivating uh, approach that that a lot of display is. Um, yeah, yeah and, and the other the other thing is that in some way, you know, in some ways, it, it's you know, I, I talk about cross channel and omni channel. However, you also have to realize that people interact with different screens and different channels and different content differently. So, re just repurposing the same content across channels isn't necessarily always the best bet. So realizing that there is some amount of nuance around content that is consumed on a mobile device versus content that's consumed on an over-the-top device um, and, and realizing that, but re recognizing, but also taking into account the uh, consistency in some way, shape or form. Yeah, really, really good point because I still see way too many TV ads that are just plopped onto, you know, my mobile phone. And like, you can't see the brand logo, you can't see the product, you know, it's, you know, when it gets shrunk down to that size, it loses all of its power. And then you have, but you know, you have advertisers struggling with, uh, you know, the quote unquote, non-working dollars um, of creating different assets, you know, for the different screens. Um, but again, that kind of goes back to that Thing we touched on before about the ecosystem, how the ecosystem needs to uh, adapt to to this new world. Yeah, and, and part the other thing that, that I that I see a lot of is that um, we have some disparities amongst the platforms. So as we start start to see consistency across platforms in terms of uh, being able to understand results, understand how each individual medium drives consumer behavior, then that drives the investment spend in, on the creative development side. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and I was, I was talking to some folks uh, a few weeks ago that said, it's not just a matter of re, uh, we're, you know, Jim, you're talking about seeing too much television advert, you know, 15 second, 30 second, 60 second advertising um, on, you know, on different platforms. Uh, and 
there are some who say you should be developing additional cuts and edits of that content. There are people saying you need to start thinking back to when you're shooting that content to be able to say there is some B-roll content or there is some other types of content that you can use on other platforms, whether it's social platforms or whether it's over the top devices or whether it's mobile devices, but it really does go all the way back to decisions in pre-production. And then, then you really get into the conversations of, of silos. Yep. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's something that we definitely have seen in certain, uh, in certain clients and advertisers who, um, they have found out that one of, one of the ways of going um, around the issue of you know, this complicated matrix of content that they need to be creating for an omnichannel you know, video presence um, is exactly that, Harold. So they decide that they, they are changing the way that they are either building the creative um, so that then downstream platforms like ourselves can help them with automation so that they finish one piece of content and then uh, we churn out the different versions for different platforms. And that has really helped them um, with not only efficiencies, but just getting, getting content out faster and making it more relevant. Yeah, and, that, and there really are kind of two uh, different kind of, well, there's a couple of different layers to it. You know, one is simply these kind of technical things of transcoding, you know, for the different technical standards of, you know, QAM and OTT and mobile and things like that. Um, um, then there's the physical elements of, you know, the sizes of the different screens. And there, there's some pretty interesting uh, dynamic content optimization, you know, technologies out there. Um, that, uh, that I've seen that are doing interesting stuff. And I think, you know, the more of that you can automate, the better, um, because that's relatively low value in terms of, you know, the, the degree of impact on the consumer mm -hmm. versus we have these opportunities, you know, I mean, right now, I think the first thing is just to figure out how to, again, stitch back together the, the reach across these, these platforms, but then, since we can target individually, we've got these great opportunities in the future to have, you know, different messages to different segments based on maybe their psychographics or, you know, their, uh, you know, loyalty to our brand or sequencing of messaging. You know, they've seen this, you know, first, you know, awareness type message uh, several times. Great. Let's give them a different message that it takes them deeper into what the brand is about or some other feature of the product. Um, and that's where the creativity and the time uh, will be much more productive mm -hmm. uh, to, to deliver, you know, uh, uh, you know, business results uh, to the brand. So, so let's put our, our people uh, on those things and let the machines take care of all the other stuff. That's a, that's, that's the that's the nirvana, right? Um, yeah. And as you are as you are talking about stitching together um, data around audience and targeting, um, you, you know, it's it's been it's been one of the current themes of our conversation so far. Um, that's one of the things based on um, on Forrester data that you guys have shared with us. One of the things that is getting advertisers so excited about this. Um, you know, the, the, the future of, you know, omnichannel video. Um, and even looking at, just looking at this data, uh, Jim, and really interested to, to, see your, to hear your take here is even within just TV, um, just looking at beyond, you know, old school TV, looking at addressable and, and advanced TV, um, advertisers already um, have an expectation that television will become more targetable. However, when they're looking at, when they're being asked around, you know, uh, consolidated or integrated planning and buying, that it's still, uh, it's still a high percentage, but still lower. Mm -hmm. Do you think, why do you think that is happening? Oh, I think that's uh, a vestige of the world we have now where we've had these separate disciplines around quote-unquote traditional and quote-unquote digital. 
And as you can see, though, the vast majority still think at some point those worlds will come together. Um, but you've got entrenched groups that, you know, I see all the time, you know, fighting over budgets and who's going to own what. And um, uh, it's just going to take more time to resolve that. And quite frankly, it's not which one of those groups owns what. It's who from those groups will emerge with the, you know, sort of hybrid view of the world that they can think about both of these things, you know, holistically, right. uh, rather than pit one versus against the other. So, definitely, very interesting. And the and this is you know uh, really interesting to hear that because we. Um, when we hear the big picture of what advertisers are trying to achieve, you know, we hear um, CMOs like Mark Pritchard of P&G really talking about it, you know, a direct to consumer uh, world when mass, you know, it will finally allow them to do mass reach with one to one precisions. Um, and that is something that do, um, I'm keen to hear your guys' thoughts, both on um, how far away are we from that? And is, uh, what are some of the blockers um, until we get there? Well, I mean, we still are at a stage where there are just these technical things. The, the world has not completely um, come together to enable this stuff yet. So we just have some, you know, basic blocking and tackling and foundational things uh, to do. And I think things like ad ID are, are part of that. Um, so let's, let's get those in place, but then it becomes a mindset issue. And um, you've got these two different mindsets right now. Traditional, you know, TV buyer is like, okay, I'm trying to get my GRPs as cheap as I can. And that's been one of the things that I hear over and over again in Addressable that, um, oh my God, the CPMs for Addressable advertising for the MVT is way, way too high, you know? Um, and when you, go, but when you go through the logic of, well, if you're getting 100%, um, you know, qualified target at whatever this CPM is, it's actually cheaper than the cheap CPMs where, you know, 50, 60, 70% of the audience actually isn't a prospect for your, uh, for your audience. Um, so I can see you've moved, you, you, you've moved to, to these other slides, which came from that research I did with the Association of National Advertisers you know, last year, where the question was, well, where are we in this migration toward these things? Um, and those bottom two bars um, represent the answer to the, the question we asked about, well, what are you doing with addressable TV and advanced TV these days? With the answers being, you know, starting from I regularly included in my TV plans to I've experimented with it, but I need to learn more before it can become a part of the schedule to I haven't bought it yet and to, gee, I don't really know anything about it. And when I saw those bars shape up like that, where there was about 15, you know, the 15 to 17% in the regularly include in plans, and then the, you know, 20, 30% experimenting and needing to learn more, it sort of rang this bell in the back of my head. So I went back to one of my old textbooks and pulled out the Everett Rogers diffusion of innovation curve, <laughs> which we all refer to knowingly or not, whether we know it's Everett Rogers or not. But when we talk about early adopters and early majority and all that, we're referring to him. And his curve is, you know, 15% are innovators and early adopters, 30% are early majority, 30% are late majority, and the last, you know, 15% are the laggards. And these numbers lined up, to me, I, th I thought they lined up pretty darn well. So when I, when I published this report last year, you know, I put the stake in the ground and said, we are finally at the inflection point <laughs> where TV is going to change. You know, we've talked about it forever. Since the dawn of the internet, we've talked about TV yeah. becoming targeting and interactive and blah, blah, blah. And very, very little has changed. But the, this data a year ago said to me, we're at that point, you know, we're gonna start seeing a much more rapid shift. Um, and I think that's why we're on this webinar today because <laughs> it, is, it is happening and there is just so much to talk about. 
Yeah. So Jim, 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 you know, I, as you say, as you, as you go through that, I, I think about some of the, um, some of the upheaval, and I, I'm going to call it upheaval, some of the upheaval that's going on in the measurement ecosystem right now. And is that, you know, it's sort of the, is, is all, are all of, is all of the uncertainty in the large measurement companies feeding into some of this challenge, the challenges of finding a new metric and finding the ways to scale a lot of these technologies and improving uh, cross-platform. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because you have, because there is this tight interdependence in the traditional TV ecosystem where you've got the Nielsen ratings, which measures all the different networks on a common standard. So when you're talking to different networks and different providers, you've got a common measurement that, you know, you can compare apples and apples to, which now in this world today, when you go from linear to OTT, you don't have that. And that's where, again, a lot of the traditional TV buyers then just stop in their tracks and go, well, I don't know how to buy OTT then if I don't have, you know, a Nielsen rating on it. So I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> the flip side is, you know, digital buyers are like, hey, give me impressions. And they don't even think that much about reach and frequency. Um, and again, they're often trained in a very direct response kind of view of the world. And they are kind of dismissive of brand. And, you know, if, if you can't measure that, that sale, then, you know, you can't measure, you know, it's, it's, you, you know, it's very fluffy. We're not, we, we don't do that in digital. We measure sales, you know? Um, so there's a lot of that change in thinking about what the metrics are and how you measure it and what sources you're going to use and what data you, you use. Um, that, you know, people are dabbling in a lot of different things. They're looking at this, you know, obviously very interesting stuff happening from the ACR providers, um, uh, which have much bigger data sets, but I'm not convinced that they are rigorous enough in, um, uh, 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 you know, making that set nationally representative. So, um, so I think there's biases in that data set that, uh, make it, you know, not quite ready for prime time, but certainly um, adds a, uh, uh, you know, a view into this, you know, this cross-channel world that just isn't available from other sources. So, again, a lot of pieces out there that we still have to figure out how to uh, mature and link together. So, in a lot of ways, what you're saying is that we still suffer from much of the walled garden mentality um, and we still have not really embraced um, fret the, the world of being of frenemies and interoperability in, in the biggest way possible. Um, to some extent, but it's not quite the same as in the digital walled gardens, you know, where they are very consciously uh, guarding an asset that they believe is proprietary. Um, to me, it's more like you know, in the, in this world, it's like Nielsen still has an important place because linear is still important. The ACR data providers, you know, have a view into the OTT world that Nielsen doesn't. Um, but then they don't have the rigor and the, um, you know, currency standard that, that Nielsen does. And, you know, there are uh, uh, other um, uh, initiatives out there through like the Coalition of Innovation, Innovative Measurement, uh, Media Measurement, trying to figure out how to, you know, piece together these different things uh, into more of a, a, a common measurement. Um, that I'm, you know, I don't think it's as much about sort of guarding a proprietary thing as it is just how the heck do you compare, you know, these different kind of data sets and, and make sense out of it all. And one of the challenges that we see uh, working with, with clients in this space is um, how do you just follow your content and um, throughout, throughout the, the supply chain mm. and the cons consumer journey? And on top of that, how can you then connect the data and the results with that specific piece of content? 
Um, so, and Harold, you you guys work a lot on this space around you know supply chain and how um, you know how how what is your view in terms of how supply chain players within an, uh, an ecosystem need to interoperate and how can that get done? Uh, and and I, I can't agree more with Jim's point about uh, the ACR vendor ecosystem and how there, there are, there is, there is, as I like to say, there is a there, there with ACR. It's just not quite there yet. Um, I like to think about a lot of these things in layers. Um, and I like to think about the, the bottom layer being what they call master data, good, good reference data that says I can then derive good data points moving further up in terms of being more and more robust, leading to big data strategies rather than thinking about big data strategies and then not having a good handle on how to actually take it back into a master data conversation that says, uh, do I know the, assets that I'm talking about? Do I know the business by which I'm talking about? Do I know the platform I'm talking about? Do I know the consumer that I'm talking about? Do I understand that I have to preserve PII? Uh, you know, and again, this whole area of master data is where I spend a lot of my time. And uh, one of the things that's important for me is looking at the, uh, the, the addressable space, the, uh, the advanced advertising space and realize that we have multiple players who aren't always playing by the same rules. Uh, you know, we have situations that we see day in and day out where the ad agency works with multiple uh, publishers, ad servers, ad networks, and they're sending the same piece of creative. And what's happening is those pieces of creative are getting proprietary identifiers or randomly gener gen uh, generated uh, serial numbers that aren't referring back to the namespace or to the name that was given to the ad at the time that it was created. So the thing that I spend a lot of time on is, you know, if you want to address uh, ad collision where you got the same ad running back to back or uh, reach and frequency to make sure that the right consumer gets the right ad and gets it at an appropriate number of times without being um, inundated. You know, we have to start thinking about these fundamental layers uh, from an ad perspective, that's ad ID. Um, and again, ad ID is very much like, the UPC code uh, for packaged goods. You know, you need every. You know, the UPC code is honored from the time of manufacture to the time of uh, purchase. And I believe we need to get to that same kind of conversation. And back, you know, back to Jim's point, that that really is when you start to see that true ROI from start to finish. Um, so that's really you know getting a good handle on master data. Um, what I call master data hygiene is something that's very important. And, you know, when we start thinking about that, you know, we uh, think about metadata and, you know, we have, we've got lots of examples where if you were to look at a variety of different systems, uh, whether they're automation systems, ad decisioning systems, demand side platforms, you could see the same advertiser name, uh, you know, uh, managed in all, all sorts of forms of different, uh, ways. So you want to look at metadata in terms of what is static and managed at the time of creation of a piece of content, uh, what is publicly available, and we use the term public, it's probably more of a inside of closed exchanges or closed inter, uh, marketplaces, uh, but what, what, meta, what metadata associated with a campaign or with an ad is dynamic and managed on the fly versus what is private that actually gets managed between individual trading partners. Uh, we live in a world of APIs, and you know APIs between different publishers or different vendors. Um, we have to start thinking about industry APIs, and uh, you know again from an ad ID perspective, uh, we have open standard APIs that eliminate the rekeying, allow for the interchange of metadata, and we need to start thinking about you know to Jim's point earlier, we need to think about how we scale things. Uh, you know, audience targeting is important, but it's, a, it's an issue of not reinventing the wheel and building those best practices to know that audience targeting happens in this manner and you use these elements of metadata and probably a vendor will apply their, uh, their secret sauce to how that metadata is managed. But again, competing on the areas that are 
above a line of standardization rather than reinventing that line of standardization, standardization everywhere. And you know, we get into this whole conversation of contextual targeting uh, all the time where, you know, my best example of contextual targeting is you're, 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 uh, you're in a piece of content where the final scene of, uh, of, a, of a piece of content before the ad break is a plane crash. You certainly don't want the first ad in that ad pod to be for an, air, an airline. You might want to think about some, uh, some smart analytics around, well, perhaps you might want to have an insurance company in that first position uh, in the ad. And I think that metadata and interoperable systems and documenting best practices uh, give us a really good handle on how to move some of these conversations forward. So, and that's that's a really that's a really interesting point because there's a drive towards automation, but at the same time, um, and we you know everyone predicts that there will be an automation everywhere, basically in everything we can we can think of, and it's possible. Uh, but at the end of um, at the end of the day, most of the not most of, there's been some major. Um, um, issues that have occurred when uh, certain processes have been automated. So, um, what what do you think is the um, what needs to change, or something that needs to be um, highlighted or stressed more in order for some of the automation around what you said at collision or tar um, contextual targeting and all of that to to finally materialize in um, in, in in our market. So I, I and you know, Jim, I'm sure you've got a point of view on this. Mm -hmm. I, the first thing that I, that I think about, and I, I was uh, at the uh, the National Association of Broadcasters conference uh, last year, where they, there was a lot of demonstration of using artificial intelligence for ad decisioning and ad targeting and contextual. When I spent time with that, you know, again, no, there, there, there's it's a very nascent space. However, when you start, when when I start to talk about the layers of managing that they all say any a any good ai model begins with a layer of master data that then feeds in that thing that can then be built then the ai metadata and dimensionality can be built around that good master data and though and, and having good you know whether you're talking about identifying the asset identifying the business identifying the consumer identifying the platform if you have all of that as good master data foundationally, artificial intelligence and automation build on top of that uh, and don't really replace it, they supplement it. Definitely. Yeah, and, and you know, artificial intelligence is still um, only as good as the intelligence that designs it to start with. So, uh, uh, you know, like that example of the, the plane crash and then what's the next ad, um, how many of those kinds of instances do we have to anticipate so we can train the AI so it can do that? We'll never, you know, get all of them. So there will be cases where there will be some, you know, juxtapositions like that that will be unfortunate. Um, and if we kind of wait until we're a hundred percent certain that nothing will ever go wrong, then it will never happen. <laughs> so I, I, I think there's, um, you know, there's gotta be some level of acceptance of we can anticipate 70 or 80% of stuff and let's go forward. And then from there, let's, you know, when we find, you know, things that we don't want to have happen, happen, then we'll train the AI, AI on those. But, uh, it's one of those, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good at, at this point of the game. That's really, um, that's, that's really fascinating because it's exactly what we have seen with some of our clients um, around, you know, as they, as they venture into this area. Um, and there's the, there, there's this trend now that we are seeing of circular planning model, which is all about what you were saying um, Jim about trial and error, right? So, and it's, there's really no longer 
a start and end, uh, a, a beginning and an end to the process, but it is the circular uh, process that happens constantly uh, within marketing of planning, execution, delivery, measurement, and then constantly keeps on and on and on. And, you know, this specific model is also being, um, you know, deployed in some of the most, you know, those legacy um, advertiser or marketers that we we're talking a little earlier, um, which um, allows them uh, to to really, uh, which which is a big deal for them because they're you know there's that uh, they're the, the the more traditionally set up uh, marketers, but they have noticed that this is the only way of doing it, and I think data becomes really core to this because you cannot have that ongoing flow of information without that master master data that you guys were talking about. Right. Right. Well, and this, if you if you go back to that example of the eight million diapering moms, um, in a world where you're buying, you know, women twenty five to fifty four, um, you don't have enough money to be on air constantly, so you're flighting. So you don't have this continuous circular model. In a world where you're only targeting eight million diapering moms, you probably can still cut your budget, and you've got budget to be on air you know, pretty constantly. And that gives you, you know, this kind of feedback, even if you buy my argument, though diapers is probably one of those e-commerce examples where people love having them shipped to them so they don't have to go running to the store for them. Um, but, um, you know, if you are on air constantly, even if it is two or three or four weeks before you have enough data to feel confident to act on a change, you're still on air. And you're still going to be on air for weeks ahead, so you can make a change and have a big impact uh, on your results. Uh, you know when you have this kind of model. Of course. And uh, mindful of time, uh, we have five minutes left. I wanted to start to kick off um, our questioning with uh, just a question for you, Jim. Um, if you can, um, if you can give us a quick update on what has changed since you wrote this report, um, and where where do you see it going? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the biggest change is um, it's happening faster. The change is happening faster than I really anticipated it. You know, I published that report about this time last year. Um, then, as I got through late summer, early fall, started thinking about what I was going to write about this year and talking to my bosses about that. Um, you know, quite frankly, at that time, I didn't see enough happening fast enough that I thought, all right, maybe I'll just sort of take a step back from TV. Um, and so I've been researching some other things and writing about other things. Um, but now I've, you know, jumped right back into it uh, with a couple of projects. The one I mentioned with my colleague, Joanna O'Connell, and uh, another with our customer experience team, um, just because it is happening, happening so much faster. Um, and I think, yeah, we've touched on a lot of the things the industry has to learn and, and has to change. Um, but again, you see all these examples, um, you know, like uh, what Harold was mentioning and the cross industry uh, uh, things, a lot of the things happening with data um, uh, that we'll, we'll see um, uh, uh, continuing. Um, and, and one of the surprising uh, results of that uh, uh, report, which is on that slide you just flashed past, was that, you know, even a year ago, people felt that TV had at least, you know, was as effective, if not more effective than it was in the past. Despite all the, you know, talk you seem to hear about, oh, TV's dying and, you know, ratings are crashing. And so, you know, you know and the world's moving toward digital. Um, but, you know, people still believe and know that TV is uh, extremely powerful. And I think these changes and these abilities to be more targeted and to be more um, uh, 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 focused uh, with video content on these different platforms uh, will only make video advertising more and more uh, effective. So. Thank you. That's uh, that's really really eye opening. Um, we and for for the audience here, we do have um, the, the link, and we'll we can we can share the the link to the report um, and to to the many really interesting takeaways that uh, Jim's report has. Um, I think we are going to um, uh, as 
I really wanted to highlight this one. This is a really, really good blog uh, blog post about what we discussed, and um, um, I, I encourage everyone to to follow Jim's um, uh, frequent blog post on that. Now, I think we are only unfortunately going to have um, time for one question, um, um, and we have someone from the audience asking around. Um, um, increased um, any any trends that you see in increased ad placements uh, for next year they're mentioning the Olympics and elections um, as as major events around the time um, and do you do you foresee a, a dip again in 2022 um, or is there something um, is there is there something else that you you see around seasonality of advertising yeah, I mean, those are fairly typical cycles um, that we've seen over the years, you know, election years and Olympics years do, you know, spending goes up and then it, it typically does does drop back a bit. But, you know, I think what's, what's more important, we certainly saw in the last couple of elections um, that the political parties have really done some very pioneering and very innovative work on using data and using targeting um, that have then caught the eye of, of brands who then try to figure out how they can uh, use those kinds of things appropriately. So it'll be interesting to see in this cycle, I know, and also in the last Olympics, I know there was a lot of uh, innovation uh, at NBC around, you know, some of their online streams versus what was broadcast and advertisers trying different things out like that. So, you know, I think those are great places where innovation uh, starts that then uh, gets deployed, you know, in that following cycle, maybe spending is down a little bit more, but some of those new ideas start to take root and start to, to play out. Great, thank you. Um, we do have another question, but unfortunately we have run out of time. Um, apologies for that. We, um, we, can, we can see if we can answer uh, some of your guys' questions separately, but thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Harold. Um, as a as a note for everyone attending, uh, the slides will be available on our website, and if you have signed up for this uh, webinar, you will get an email notification once those are available. Um, thanks again for this great uh, conversation, uh, and we're looking forward to seeing where the next uh, the next era in this uh, new world order will take us.